So why do we have earthquakes in the interior of a plate? And the answer is because the plates are moving. If you took a real plate, or if you took a table, and shoved it really hard from both sides and squeezed it from the sides, there would be stresses in the middle. So the plate driving forces are mostly happening at the mid-ocean ridges and the subduction zones, the boundaries. Those plates are also moving. This map shows the motion of North America re uh, relative to the underlying mantle. And you can see that there's a motion direction. And as it moves, it's dragging over the stuff underneath it. And that's going to apply stresses to the plate. And from those forces that we know about, one can predict the compression or extension within the continent. And this plot shows with these little arrows the direction of maximum compression within the North American plate. And we see here in eastern North America a roughly east-west direction of compression being predicted from knowing about the plate driving forces at the edges of the plate and the bottom of the plate that we're predicting a maximum, a compression first of all, and a maximum direction that's roughly east-west here in eastern North America. Now a few decades ago we had data and these data are being found in shallow boreholes and measuring what directions does the borehole change shape and crack. And using that, we can get the maximum compressional direction. And again, we're getting numbers that are broadly, at least not exactly consistent, but broadly consistent with what we're getting from the modeling, showing, again, a roughly east-west compression here in the central, U uh, central eastern US. Indeed, if we know uh, from the actual ground shaking, we can actually measure what happened during the earthquake. So if we have a fault slipping, like said between my two hands, and it slipped in that direction, people on that side of the room see my hands, see the earth moving towards them, and people on this side of the room see my hand moving away from them, if we map the direction of motion on our seismometers, we can figure out the orientation of the fault and the direction in which it slipped. And this is a beach ball diagram that actually does, shows that. It's a, th think of the lower half of a sphere measuring the direction. Don't worry about the details of how, how you'd understand this. But basically what it says is that we had compression in this direction on a map, a little bit uh, south of east, that we had compression in that direction during that event, and that the fault itself was sloping down about 45 degrees to the southeast. Okay, so we had compression. And again, this is very much similar to that normal fault, roughly east-west, not quite east-west, compression that squeezed and caused, squeezed in this direction, caused a fault sloping like that to the southeast, in the, or to the east-southeast in this case, and caused the upper part of the fault to move upwards relative to the lower part of the fault. Okay, so we had a fault very much like this is what the slip was on this particular event. Now the area of slip, and I don't have a slide showing this, is about eight kilometers by about four kilometers based on the aftershocks. People actually studying the shaking during the earthquake think it's actually a little bit smaller than that, but a little bit more motion on the fault. And the motion of the fault would have been some tens of centimeters of sudden slip occurring at a speed of kilometers per second. So very, very fast speed. Geologically, it occurred in the Piedmont province of Virginia. Zooming on in, it occurred within the Chumpsawampum, chum, chum, say that, thank you, <laughs> Chumpsawampsic terrain within, <laughs> that's the geologist who knows that better than I do, uh, in Virginia. So the central terrain and occurred at this location, and you can tell that this is not sitting on top of one of the major known Paleozoic tectonic collision faults. It's occurring somewhere between them. This map shows in white the non-instrumentally recorded, at least no local instrument recorded earthquakes in the lighter reds, the 1977 to 2011, and then the actual 2011 event. And you can see this seismic zone between Richmond, Charlottesville, and Lynchburg is occurring mostly within the Piedmont province, within these hard, old crystalline rocks. We have that seismic reflection section I showed you before along Interstate 64. Here's a picture of data. It doesn't show up very well on a low resolution screen. An interpreted version of that. And again, we can see these terrains being pushed up over top of North America down here, being pushed up into the uh, west during collision. And these little circles, this was published in 1988, these little circles are showing the earthquakes in the late 70s and early 80s on that. And they're occurring above this particular thrust sheet right in here, at and above that thrust sheet of very, very shallow depths, less than, eight, less than 10 kilometers depth. And sure enough, that is where this particular event has occurred. It's occurred right in here on that cross section. Again, within that particular geologic train we were talking about before. So we have a picture in three dimensions that looks something like this. I would actually say the top of that wasn't quite that shallow, but a, a fault where one side moved up relative to the other side. 
slipping suddenly like this in that earthquake. But the orientation of the fault, which we can get from these motions of, of the, the first motions, is actually not parallel to these faults, but is actually more northerly than those ancient Paleozoic faults. And it turns out that this is roughly the direction of the opening at the Atlantic fault, which we're extending the crust roughly in this direction during the opening of the Atlantic 200 million years ago. Those faults, of course, were pulling the continent apart, but those older structures are still there. And if you have a new stress system that's squeezing it back together, you can imagine the new stresses being accommodated or reactivating those older structures. So the thought is that this is what's happening here. Yes? And notice the orientation of these basins. Right? Yeah. These basins are now all that dissimilar to the yeah. orientation of that fault, and that those are all mesozoic structures. So the, these are the, the 200 million year rough, give or take some tens pulling a part of the continent which isn't quite at the same angle as the faults related to the collision. So this is probably reactivating the same types of faults that form these basins during the Triassic. Okay, so that's the thought on this particular earthquake. Um, after the earthquake occurred, a whole bunch of scientists went out and put a bunch of extra seismometers to better understand the aftershocks, because after you have a big event, you have a whole bunch of crackling and popping afterwards. And I got told we had a magnitude three point something just yesterday, 3.1 yesterday. I just heard about that from you folks. Um, this map shows between Richmond, Charlottesville, and Fredericksburg. The epicenter is right in here, and the red and blue symbols are the traditional aftershock deployment. I'll talk about the green one in a few minutes. The red and blue symbols were a traditional, actually relatively dense aftershock deployment that was put out there to listen to these aftershocks. They're put out by the U.S. Geologic Survey, the uh, Virginia Tech, uh, IRIS, and Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory in about that order and how many instruments each put out, listening to the aftershocks. And if we zoom on in, you can sort of see this green pattern here. We'll zoom on into that. You can see where the epicenters, which, uh, sorry, where the, uh, where the aftershocks are occurring in a map. Here's two kilometers for scale, so we're really zooming on in. This is the USGS epicenter, which was recorded by those stations, only one of which was in Virginia. This was the epicenter that included the Virginia Tech instruments that were not paid for by anybody, but the data had been shared. And using these new stations that were deployed listening to the aftershocks, the aftershocks are much more accurately located, and they're occurring where the epicenter from Virginia Tech was. This is what caused it to be called the mineral earthquake, because mineral is just off the top of the map over here. It's actually closer to Louisa. The actual real earthquake was closer to Louisa. And this error is caused by not having enough stations nearby doing the locations. So it's named mineral by the USGS, but the USGS has the worst data to name it mineral. I personally would prefer to call Louisa or Louisa County earthquake or Central Virginia earthquake. Um, mapping those earthquakes in vertical crust slice, this is depth down down, eight kilometers there, and horizontal distance at a one-to-one -one aspect ratio. And if you rotate, this slice and make the slice in the right direction. Basically, this is the compression direction based on the original earthquake. Sure enough, the aftershocks are defining. So these, these aftershocks would extend in some considerable direction, uh, distance in this direction, defining the plane of the fault that slipped during the main event. So it's southeast. Sorry. Um, yeah, this, this, that's North 120. Right. So it's sloping off to the southeast. Yes, sloping off to the southeast. Yeah. Um, my own involvement in this, I'm not an earthquake seismologist, I do that type of imaging. But one of the principles that we use in my business to do this type of imaging is we put lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of stations down. So we quickly ran out, I think it was four days after the event, and put out 200 stations, which are these green symbols, and they go all the way up to Fredericksburg. You see these stations going off towards Fredericksburg. Um, at a much denser spacing in order to get higher resolution imagery of, and, and to basically test the concept of putting out more instruments and what we can do with them. Were those Texans? Those were Texans, which were the wrong instruments to do this with, meant way, way more manpower. And I have to give a lot of credit to my students because they were out deploying these instruments during not one but two hurricanes brushing into Virginia. <laughs> it, was, it was a fun couple of weeks. Um, the advantage of putting these stations out really close together is that this is a magnitude almost two earthquake that the broader network saw. And, and on our, this was only 100 of our stations that were out that particular day. Um, on our stations, because they're so close together, you can see these earthquakes both have good signal to noise. So you can see quiet 
and noisy, so time goes downwards in these plots. So here's our P wave arriving and our S wave arriving on that line, and here's a P wave and S wave arriving on a perpendicular line. Not only can you see these on a magnitude 2 earthquake, which they can easily detect, but we can actually see this when the signal gets really, really noisy. As you can see before the earthquake occurs and after the earthquake occurs, the signal strength isn't that much different. But because the earthquakes are so close together, you can see the same pattern very, very easily in these data. I detect, in this case, a magnitude minus 1 earthquake. And before anybody asks me the question of how can you have a negative magnitude, it's because amplitude times log to base 10 is how you get magnitude. So that scale goes into the negative numbers. When we're talking about fracking jobs, we're talking about magnitude minus two earthquakes being a typical number that's being produced by fracking, which you've all heard about. In this case, this is magnitude minus one earthquake that we're, we're recording uh, using these surface stations. So really, really very close to the noise levels. Um, and we also can produce maps of where the earthquakes are. This is just the first 100. We have about uh, 1,700 earthquakes, we believe, in the first two weeks after the event going down to fairly small magnitude. And what this is is a vertical slice like before, but we're swinging that vertical slice. We're rotating it about a vertical axis. And you can see it's kind of distributed until you look at it at just the right angle right there. And the thing rotates around again, and it's kind of distributed until you look at it on just the right angle here. And we're hoping that we can uh, use, rather than just, I think there's 70 earthquakes in this section, to show all 1,700 and actually plot where the faults are in a lot more detail than what we're getting with a more traditional network. So that's our goal with these instruments. Um, I think Patrick already mentioned this. USRA will drastically densify compared to what we had last August. Okay. <laughs> drastically densify the number of stations that we have in the East Coast for studying fortuitous events that happen during the two years it's there, but it's only there for two years as a direct result of shaking up Congress. <laughs> Sometimes it's a good thing. <laughs> we actually, uh, the President has put it in his budget request for fiscal year 13, which of course won't really be budgeted until after the election, and he's already mandated by, by presidential order the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, the U.S. Geologic Survey, and the National Science Foundation that's operating EarthScope to talk to one another. NSF will take over, the plan is for NSF to take over something like this, one in, one in fourth of the instruments, uh, operate them for a few years until they can be handed off to one of the other agencies for longer term maintenance of this type of a network. Again, even this is much better than what we had last summer. So there's a goal to do that. Uh, I think the President's already approved it. He's already told them to start talking about it. I think there's a pretty decent chance of getting uh, funding even in this tight climate right now. And I think that's my last slide, if I remember. Oh, yeah, my final slide. <laughs> <laughs>